Olivia. I'm the only journalist who's been expelled from that. Actually, there were two of us because we both did it. I'm the only journalist, I think, with the guys in the Australian who's been expelled from Libya for a good reason. They were right and we were wrong. So uh, I think I'm unique in having been expelled for doing something really awful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we largely fabricated a story about poor Vanessa Redgrave who was there. Um, <laughs> for the Daily Mail. Oh. <laughs> Right, I, you know, we, we heard Professor Atala just before on the, the video talking about the frontiers of medicine, about doing stuff that, you know, seems incredible, doesn't it? Printing kidneys. Oddly, at the same time as this uh, astonishing advance in technology is going on, lots of us choose disease. So it's a paradox that we want Wake Forest to push the very boundaries of, of how you sustain life, but lots of us make choices that go in exactly the opposite direction. That's what I want to talk about tonight. Um, I want to talk first about language, which might not seem uh, totally and immediately relevant, but I think there's a lesson from it. How many of you have seen the sign down here, the famous sign about no entry for heavy goods here? <laughs> <laughs> It's an example of what happens when you try to force people to do stuff. So we have a, we have a law that I'm pretty much in favour of in Wales that requires bilingualism in most circumstances. So the council is required to translate that sign, right? No entry for heavy goods vehicles. Unfortunately, they sent it to the translator while the translator was on holiday and got the translator's automatic response that said, I'm out of the office at the moment. <laughs> Please send any work. Well, there's a lesson in that. It's what happens when you try to force people to do stuff. It goes wrong. So I'm more in favour of trying to push people to do the right thing. So in, in that spirit, I've done bits of this presentation in Welsh and bits in English, but I haven't done both. So with any luck, at the end of it, the people who don't speak Welsh will feel they might have missed something. <laughs> now, I want you to do some work. You've been sitting here all evening. I want you to do some work. Serious decision. I'll tell you who these children are, and then I want you to tell me what you would have done. I can just about see you. So. These children are from the front cover of Awake magazine. How many of you have been, have been the, the, the recipients of a sales pitch for Awake magazine? Again, yeah, not many of you live in the valleys. Right, so Awake magazine is the Jehovah's Witness magazine. And they come around and sell it all the time to us, try to. These kids on the front of it were kids who themselves, or their family, refused a blood transfusion on religious grounds. Some of them survived, some of them didn't. Now, if you <coughs> were sitting in a court, you were the judge, how many of you would order that these children receive a blood transfusion, whatever their parents wanted or didn't? Can I show a, see a show of hands? How many would order it? Ah, oh, interesting. About 60% about of you, by the way. Okay, let me ask you a slightly different question. Let's say these children died. Let's say the parents had been told a blood transfusion was almost certain to save them and had still refused it. A, a real circumstance. Ha doesn't happen in Europe because most Europeans are a bit more prescriptive than you. So in Europe, these court cases nearly always require that people receive blood transfusions. But it happens in the US. The parents don't give the blood transfusion, the child dies, the parents are prosecuted for manslaughter. You're on the jury. How many of you vote to convict? <coughs> okay, let me ask you a slightly different question. This kid here, this kid here is a kid called Mac. Matt Lucic. His parents agree that they're responsible for him ending up in this condition. By the way, there's a happy ending. 
he, he recovered fully. Matt Lutrich got a, a bacterial infection called Haemophilus influenza B. Very rare these days, but fortunately there was an old doctor at the hospital, a doctor old enough to have seen these cases in the past, knew what it was and saved Matt's life. He had a, a, such a severe swelling of the throat, he could hardly breathe. He was helicopter, the air lifted, major drama. <coughs> the parents were told there's a 95% chance he'll be brain damaged, permanently impaired. He wasn't. The good news is he's a normal kid, he survived. The reason he got sick is because the mother's chiropractor had said to her that he heard bad things about vaccinations. So she decided not to vaccinate him. Let's say Matt hadn't been so lucky. Let's say Matt had succumbed, which it looked as if he might. Again, you were on the jury. The parents have made a decision not to give the kid a vaccine. Had they given the kid a vaccine, it's highly unlikely he would have developed this infection. <coughs> How many of you voted to convict? It's interesting. Hardly any. And I don't really understand the difference, I have to tell you, but it's totally consistent. There's normally this difference. The reason the parents didn't vaccinate is this man. British doctor, one of our less good exports to the United States, uh, but fortunately, as the old country song says, thank God and greyhounds, he's gone, he's gone. Uh, he's moved to Texas. He's a gentleman called Andrew Wakefield who faked a series of uh, <laughs> observations of children and suggested that vaccines were linked to autism. It's now been revealed that these were completely fake. Uh, and not only that, they were largely funded by solicitors who were suing vaccine companies. Not only fake, but what's more dishonest than fake? I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, they had raised the media coverage of his work, and there's been a really good analysis of his media coverage, by the way, down at the University of Cardiff, which shows what the problems were in reporting his work and then in, in uh, showing it to be a fake. Just last month, there was an outbreak of measles in Minnesota, among Somalis in Minnesota. And so Dr. Wakefield got the place to go and tell the parents, the Somali parents in Minnesota, yes, you're quite right, you shouldn't be vaccinating your children. I, I, I have a problem with why it is that we allow ourselves to make these potentially very serious decisions based on internet gossip, effectively. But what do people do? They come at it for lots of different reasons. So this woman over here is the head of the Communist Party Marxist-Leninist of India. The man in the middle is a right-wing state senator uh, from California. And the gentleman on the left is a medical doctor who belongs to the Muslim Council of Britain. What they all have in common is they don't like vaccines. Now, they're not quite sure why you have different reasons. She thinks it's a multinational conspiracy, he thinks it's a UN plot, and the guy on the right worries that they're not halal. So they all have different reasons, but they're all anti-vaccines. What's quite interesting is they all come together. They don't let it worry them that their reasons for opposing vaccines are entirely different. They just get together and oppose them. And lots of people on the internet follow them. So what we run the risk of is going back to things which are outside living memory for most of us. Um, this is months. I'll come on to this in a minute. We, we really have uh, outbreaks of months going on all around us now. Uh, on the far left is something that I... I think it's highly unlikely with smallpox, which has been eradicated. So unless some terrorist somewhere gets access to uh, uh, one of the two remaining supplies, uh, uh, that won't come back. And of course, the picture in the middle is something that for my mother, who's 80, was a living terror when she was a child. Polio. And, and you know, my mother remembers being told, don't tread in puddles during the summer because children who come into contact with water get polio. And you'll hear a great deal about polio, and we'll talk about it in just a second, because there's a, a move afoot now to eradicate polio finally, something that's actually in sight, it's a pretty good idea. 
Let me first of all though talk about marks. So the notice on the far right is a notice in Yiddish that was put out to the Hasidic Jewish community in New York. So you know the Hasidic, the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic Jews who wear the, the big black hat. They, by the way, are totally blameless in this story. They have better vaccination rates than the community as a whole. But the Hasidim travel. So the Hasidim travel. One of their children travels to Europe, where we have rather poor vaccination rates. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, contracted uh, months went back to New York and in this tightly knit community there were within a few months last year 20,000 cases of months. Um, it, it's not just in New York among Hasidic Jews. This is the case in England and Wales from 2006-2011. So like Clive, I apologise, I have a graph too. I only have one. And you'll see, we're back to having measles outbreaks in the United Kingdom. Now, for those of us who live in areas of poverty and deprivation, this is one of the rare times that deprivation is good for your health. You'll see that in Wales, in the first half of 2009, we had 286 cases in the whole country, 215 of them in quite prosperous mid to west Wales. This is because educated parents who are on Facebook, reading the internet, choose not to vaccinate their children. In the valleys, we do as we're told. <laughs> <laughs> well, not all, but in the <laughs> Of course, in developing countries, as I said earlier, the situation is much more serious. You know, measles we can treat here. There'll be some children who are permanently injured. Nearly all will survive, and most of them will, will recover fully. In the developing world, we still have cases of polio, and we still have serious outbreaks of polio. But this actually shows you a bit of the dilemma. Polio is a terrible disease, and the vaccines to prevent polio do prevent it. But there are actually two vaccines to prevent polio. How many of you, I bet you it's an age thing, how many of you knew that? A couple. No, you all look, you both look quite young. Young and well informed. There, we <laughs> there are actually two vaccines to prevent polio. There's the original injectable vaccine, which is completely safe slightly less effective, and very much more expensive. And then there's an oral polio vaccine, which probably is what most of us had, right? Well, most of us who a certain age, yeah, had, which was on a sugar key. That vaccine is a bit more effective, but for every 1.5 million, 2 million doses, it actually causes a case of polio. So in the United States, when they abandoned using oral vaccines and went to injectable, there were about 15 cases of polio a year caused by the vaccine. And in India, there still are. It's a, a source of big controversy. So this is a real decision we have to be honest about. And you'll hear a great deal of discussion about eradicating polio, and you'll hear very little about this issue. The reason why is we still have a mindset that was formed in the 1950s. The American Academy of Pediatrics in the early 1950s said, don't discuss this, it might disturb people. Well, that's right, it might disturb people. But if we don't tell the truth, then we lose credibility, right? So if we say to parents, get your children vaccinated against polio, it's completely safe. Instead of saying it's much safer than the risk of not being vaccinated, then we are the end run the risk of, of losing credibility. And I think in part because of that, we have this myth that's cropped up around the Muslim world that polio vaccine is linked to infertility. Definitely not linked to infertility. Not a single suggestion is linked to infertility, but there are a couple of other issues. We have a similar situation in TV. We desperately need a new TV vaccine in the world. But most of the experts want to explain why we so desperately need a new TB vaccine. We need a new TB vaccine because <coughs> the old one might not work at all. There are several different variants of it. And if it does work, it doesn't actually prevent TB. It probably reduces complications in children. And it sometimes causes some quite nasty side effects, like these swollen lymph nodes over here, you can see. Now, there's a prevailing wisdom that if we just keep quiet about that. 
tell people to get their kids vaccinated, they won't panic. It will go away. Of course, that's bad. Not good if your child's effect is very distressing. TB is much worse. <coughs> so, if it were me, knowing what I know that BCG might not work terribly well, might not do much to prevent TB, might cause some side effects, I'd still take it because the alternative is immeasurably worse. Now, I think that's the sort of approach we have to take. And it becomes more important in the future. Um, I, I would just say there are, there's a whole series of choices about health we have to make. Desperately poor people are really good at making these choices in general. Because desperately poor people make choices every day about survival. I don't know if any of you have played those games online where you are given the same resources as a villager in Africa and you see how long you can survive. It takes most Europeans a few weeks to kill themselves. Uh, <laughs> because we're not good at those choices. Really poor people are fine with making tough choices. Really rich people, like Jim Carrey, noted anti-vaccine activist, are much less good at this stuff. In the future, it will become a big issue because we'll have vaccines that will reduce your likelihood of cancer, that will uh, reduce your likelihood of getting a hospital infection should you need to go to hospital. We'll have to make decisions about whether we take those vaccines and almost certainly about whether we take them. Because if there's a vaccine that reduces my risk of getting prostate cancer, from 20% to 15%, let's say. Wow, something I would definitely pay for. Might have a slightly less attractive proposition to the Welsh Assembly government. <laughs> instead of explaining this, instead of giving people the tough choices, we're stuck in a sort of 1950s mindset. So on the right here is the Department of Health website. If you click through about four times, you can find some of the issues we've been talking about. But by and large, it's full of pretty pictures of happy children and telling people we know what you should do. And I, I, I've illustrated it by showing uh, something I'm happy to say I'm not quite old enough to remember, the Welsh TV channel that went off the air in 1964. The other side, the people who don't like vaccines, whether because they're Marxists who think it's a corporate class or doctors in the pay of solicitors or people who think it's a UN conspiracy to dominate the world, are much better at this stuff. They live in the digital media age. And so if you like, this is the downside of social networks. That it's easy for people who have extreme ideas to propagate those ideas to get traction. And if authority looks like it's playing its old-fashioned role of telling people what to do, they'll win. So, I would say, we have to be honest with people. So life's a series of choices. We can't guarantee you that the choices will be right, but we can tell you about the choices that are more likely to be right. And that'll become more and more important as we have to make choices about where we spend our money. Now, as you know, today, anybody who suggests taxing fast food will be immediately vilified. But if we think the state should pay for every preventive measure, it makes sense for the state to be taxing McDonald's. By the way, to come back to the issue of language just before I finish, it also, of course, makes sense for the state to be paying for bilingualism. But I'm sure you've seen the search, it shows that bilingual people are at least, are likely to have at least five years more of Alzheimer's free life than people who are monolingual. <laughs> <laughs> Just imagine. <laughs> so, I would leave you with the thought that we have to uh, get people to make rational choices just like the language. We have to give them incentives. We have to push them. We have to make them want to do it. But ultimately, we probably can't compel them to. And we certainly don't have to look like it. I've stolen shamelessly from two books for this talk, and I want to uh, recommend them both to you. I don't think either are available in uh, the UK. Uh, this, this, uh, this book on the left uh, talks about how 
social media and the internet have spread a panic about vaccines. And the book on the right uh, is a wonderful description of what will happen if we don't start uh, to help people to make better choices. Thank you very much.